Again, many thanks for the invitation to speak at this global symposium. I'm going to talk about the uh, good for human society in the Earth we can do using artificial intelligence and digital technologies, just like the other speakers uh, in the symposium. Particularly, I'm going to be talking about intelligent decarbonization. The idea here is to utilize artificial intelligence and cyber fiscal systems to decarbonize the economy and thereby help achieve climate mitigation targets. Let's dive into it. Why are these two critically important topics? Because they're both existential risks. And here you can see uh, what I believe is the best visualization of the climate change issues. You can see here years from the mid 19th century to 21st century years with below average global temperature represented in blue, while uh, red years represent uh, years in which the average temperature was higher. And as you can see from this, the last years, the Earth is getting hotter and hotter. And obviously, this has impacts on human habitat, animal habitat, as uh, food supply and uh, water supply. So we really have to uh, sort the climate change issue in order to uh, um, in order to ensure humanity's survival, and that's why it's an existential risk. Uh, on the other hand, we have superintelligence, and obviously, this community. You have all read the book Superintelligence by the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom. What do we do when a uh, superintelligence runs out of course, when it's getting malignant and actually wants to interfere with human survival? Um, this is also an existential risk, so we're talking about two very critical topics for humanity. However, our idea really was is how can we utilize artificial intelligence to combat climate change? Yeah. And this is uh, the first graph sort of kicked off the complete idea in 2019. Uh, we really want to harness artificial intelligence for the good. What you can see here is uh, the energy use of a Google, a Google server installation uh, that was optimized with uh, DeepMind's technology. You can see the energy savings here in green and the training cycles in blue. Uh, and from this, you can see that uh, already the initial optimization led to an improvement of 12% for energy use for cooling of the servers. Obviously, server cooling is an enormous problem for energy use overall. We're getting more and more servers, uh, and these are emitting a lot. Yeah. You can see that over the course of a year, with roughly 18 million training cycles, you can optimize this to 30%. Now, the critical idea we had is if we do that for all of the economy, if we have these capabilities um, rolled out on a large scale, what can we actually do? And we think we can do a lot, and that's what um, the rest of the talk is going to be about. However, the question is, how can it be that artificial intelligence has so, such a direct impact on uh, many areas of human life? We, in the end, have created a digital world via intelligence sensors, the Internet of Things, edge computing, cloud storage. So in the end, we've created a digital representation of the real, of the physical world in cyberspace. The next trick is now the cyberspace is not only a digital representation of the real world, but it can interact. And that gives us the opportunity to deploy state-of-the-art artificial intelligence to help optimize it. Here you can see uh, the industrial realm as an example. So, for instance, we can uh, manage uh, the inputs we need, maybe oil, gas, water, or, or energy, and essentially reduce costs using state-of-the-art digital technologies. This interplay between the cyber and the physical world we're calling cyber-physical systems. And these cyber-physical systems essentially were critical for the fourth industrial revolution. You know, the first three 
The fourth one is now uh, what I've already mentioned, the cyber physical system, the Internet of Things, uh, etc. So all factories are getting uh, optimized, they're getting integrated, uh, and we can deploy artificial intelligence capabilities. The recommended reading here really is Klaus Schwab's The Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, if you're interested in this. All this is a blessing, especially for asset-heavy industries. Just imagine you're in an industry with lifetimes of 50 or 60 years for your equipment. You now have to meet government targets for emissions reductions. You cannot really do much about the physical world, but you can use some digital technologies to optimize your factory, for instance. So that's where the idea came, came from. So we produced this compendium uh, published by Springer Nature uh, in collaboration with Cambridge CAS, the Singapore outpost of the University of Cambridge. And you can see it's not an academic exercise. We're working with big corporates, with governments, with uh, startups, and with NGOs to actually address this because it's just too complex. Good. Let's look at the results. The most interesting part, we're in an unpredictable world. That's one of, one of the outcomes. We'll um, use uh, photovoltaic uh, electricity production as an example here. Uh, here you can see a graph of the levelized cost of energy uh, and its uh, evolution of the last uh, decade. You can see this is almost an exponential decrease for the fun, you look at the forecast from 2010 of the International Energy Agency. Yeah, you can see it. this is uh, vastly underestimating the improvements of the levelized cost of energy, in fact, by uh, 82%. So, solar power is meanwhile the cheapest power if we look at the range we need for uh, fossil fuels uh, to produce electricity. We are now well below that. The question is now, why did we underestimate this? We think uh, from our book, it becomes clear that we have a, a virtuous circle here that improves the uh, overall production. Firstly, we are producing uh, solar cells with a higher efficiency, reduced resource uh, use, reduced that results in reduced embedded carbon. And we can also increase the efficiency. And all this is due to production wire industry 4.0, advanced digital technologies, and IRI. So with these improved solar cells with higher efficiency and lower embedded carbon, then uh, result in more efficient electricity generation, extended life, and we're feeding uh, lower carbon electricity back into the production process. So we have a very clear virtual circle here with feedback loop. And that's why we think um, this is pretty much unpredictable. And we often underestimate progress because we think in linear terms. So now, solar electricity is obviously very good because low carbon electricity doesn't use much resources, uh, not as many resources as uh, fossil generated power. But there are other problems. So in the early days, uh, electricity provision was relatively simple. We have a centralized power plant. We generate electricity, give it into transmission and distribution, and it ends up in residential or industrial uh, areas. Now, with intermittent renewables, which you can see down on the left, uh, this has gotten, gotten a, a lot more complex. Also, we have uh, distributed energy provision because, uh, for instance, in Europe and North America, more and more solar cells are, are installed. So we're getting at a very complex uh, system here. We have energy flow here in solid arrows, but we also have information flow back. So how can we manage this all? Obviously, a human cannot manage this with really automation. Uh, as soon as we automate it with digital, digital technologies, we can deploy AI capabilities. And here is a very good contribution from uh, a company called Electricity that was just bought by a, a big player. Uh, here you can see the city of Basel in my home country, Switzerland. 
Uh, and what they are doing with their software is they uh, forecast uh, electricity demand for essentially uh, residential and commercial areas, and uh, they uh, forecast what will be produced with um, the solar power. Uh, and in the end, we are matching uh, demand forecast with supply forecast. We continuously uh, include weather forecasts and uh, weather radar into this so we can estimate the electricity backup that we do require. And this is automated in a, a, a complete process. How does this help us? Uh, it helps us um, reduce the excess electricity that we have fed into the grid uh, for a long time just by optimization by artificial intelligence. So this saves us electricity and consequently emissions. If deployed on a large scale, this will really make a difference to to electricity production and their emissions. Uh, what can, else can we do to manage this? Uh, we can use blockchain technology, for instance, smart contracts to use it for energy trading. Very good contribution from the National University of Singapore here. You can see that uh, decentralized energy trading is the biggest factor uh, for is the biggest factor, the most projects for uh, blockchain uh, technology. Yeah. So let's leave this for a bit. Also here, same contribution. We're looking at supply chains. Supply chains are getting more and more efficient due to digital optimization. So the logistics industry has been at the forefront of, uh, of this. We have now RFID readers and everything. That we have artificial intelligence that optimizes routes, et cetera, et cetera. So optimizing the way we get goods around obviously has a beneficial impact for the emissions from the logistics industry. Um, but it's not just optimization of the status quo. We can also use it as a planning tool. And here you have a very good contribution from uh, the ETH Zurich, especially the Singapore Center of the ETH. Uh, here you can see a, a shot of the city of Singapore, obviously very humid and hot um, uh, city. Uh, climate change will probably change that, make this humidity and heat even worse. So what is being done here by uh, very smart architects and city planners is that they take climate scenarios, uh, weather variation, change in the built environment, and they create models of the city and how different things will affect uh, heat and outdoor com thermal comfort in the city. Yeah. So they are using this to create scenarios for uh, different cost benefits of interventions, energy consumption and emissions impact. So here when an eye supported digital models, service decision support tools. So they don't optimize the status quo, but they indeed work on the future. They help us plan. And uh, if you're interested in this, please do check out Cooling Singapore. Uh, they are concerned with you know, reducing heat islands in the city. Uh, here in the red middle of Singapore, you can see downtown, the downtown area um, where the skyscrapers are. And they obviously want to minimize uh, additional heat uh, in this area. So we can optimize the status quo using AI, but we can also uh, use it as a planning tool. Here a, a bit from us, I slip in some of our commercial work. You can here see the uh, city of Pirmasens in Germany. Uh, you can see a, a level of detail to representation of the buildings. You can see the sewage network. And we are step by step building a digital twin to help optimize the city. We even include very uh, detailed models of the building uh, on a building information management level. Uh, and we are using solar radiation data to do uh, exactly the same as we've seen for, before for the city of Basel so that we can integrate all the energy systems, harness synergy between the different energy systems and then help optimize um, the resource use and consequently the emissions of the city. Uh, another very uh, important topic is water supply. 
Obviously, with climate change, water supply will become more scarce. Uh, at the moment, global energy demand for water already equals Australia's energy demand. Reason for that is, and uh, this is explained in a very good contribution by the company Siemens, um, uh, it's a very energy intense project. Many regions in the world um, utilize desalination. That's an energy intense process. Then you have to go through the supply chain, pump the water to um, the consumers, domestic, industrial, and agricultural. You have to collect the wastewater and treat the wastewater. And um, you can see here, supply and desalination of water are the, the biggest areas. But in all of these areas that you can see here, we can optimize this using digital advanced digital technologies such as NLDL. Um, Siemens estimates that with existing technologies, we can reduce uh, the energy use from water provision globally by 10 to 16%. With advanced technologies um, like artificial intelligence, uh, we can multiply this. So we can drastically reduce uh, the water, the carbon footprint of water, and that will be an important topic, obviously, because we want to have water security for more and more people, and climate change will force us to utilize desalination more and more. Good. Let's talk about the overall impact. Uh, most of you have seen this curve already. It's the so-called marginal abatement cost curve. On the y-axis, you see it the abatement cost here in Europe per ton of CO2, and on the x-axis you see the abatement potential uh, in gigatons per year. In bold you see the old values that were published in 2010, and uh, in opaque you see the you see the values that we have now that we deploy uh, intelligent technologies to it. I'll give you solar in blue in the middle here as an example. So A, we reduce the cost of solar provision, but due to um, manage, grid management technologies that allow us to get more solar capabilities online, we also increase the abatement potential. Same goes for building. I uh, also mentioned buildings already. Uh, we increase um, the, not only the potential, but also we reduce the cost of CO2 emission abatement from the built-in environment. And our estimation is that we have more than 50% to gain just deploying digital technologies right now. So um, we can already see that uh, intelligent uh, digital technologies can really make a difference to um, the climate change uh, problematic. The economic impact, um, just a guesstimate I wrote here, this is a 2018 estimate, um, which estimates that by the end of this decade, the contribution of AI to the global economy will be 7.4%. We already know that this is a vast underestimation right now, and we're in the year 2023. So uh, just like with the emission impact, we think that the economic impact of artificial intelligence will be a multiple of this. Um, so, and I wouldn't make any uh, predictions at the moment because also my predictions will be out of date by the end of the year, the latest. You know. However, what we can do uh, about economic forecasts, we can also uh, include artificial intelligence capability into this forecast and hence build different scenarios on, on the impact. Good. Scenario planning inside a digital twin. I already mentioned Singapore here. At the moment, uh, I said we have actuation and data transfer between the physical world and uh, a digital twin. The digital twin helps us to optimize the status quo. But now we can actually change the digital twin and provide different scenarios. So where should I build my new plant? Where should I build a park? Can I build a skyscraper here? Yeah. So we can uh, run all this in the digital twin before we build it in the real world and learn it the hard way. 
and we can build different scenarios. Then we pick out the most advantageous and build the physical world according to that prediction. And we do that over and over again. And so here you can see that artificial intelligence will help us build a better future just by planning. Also, if we use such an approach, we don't have the risks that are often associated with um, artificial intelligence. So we're not leaving the decisions to the artificial intelligence, but we're leaving the building of different scenarios to the artificial intelligence while humans will pick out the most advantageous. Yeah, so we have a complete systems evolution that's supported by artificial intelligence. Conclusions. Cyber-physical systems, um, smart cities, industry for now, allow us to understand system better. They help us to optimize the status quo, increase the lifetime of our infrastructure. Um, the increased lifetime leads to a lower life cycle costs and lower emissions. And uh, digital twins furthermore allow us to plan the future using scenarios. And this helps us avoid, avoid lock-in situations uh, helps us avoid planning mistakes. Yeah. So the answer to the question I posed in the beginning, can CPS and AI contribute to decarbonization? It's absolutely a yes. We have, of course, in the book look at the cost benefit of uh, emission saving and emissions generated, but it's definitely advantageous. So we always uh, save more emissions than the digital technologies actually create. And AI is therefore, uh, in our opinion, likely to facilitate, facilitate the transition to a net zero economy in a certain society. Also, AI will help to improve economics forecast via agent-based model. And that's it from me. I thank you very much for your attention and I am looking forward to your questions. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. So, um, see any questions from the audience? So you can just like um previous session, you can feel free to put your question in the chat. And maybe one question from myself first. Mm -hmm. And as I as I know, um um the solution, the AI solutions you mentioned um in in the sharing is quite quite a big thing, I would say. Because it involves like the city's planning, it involves mm -hmm. about the energy. So um, in from in the implementation part, um, can you share uh, some challenges when those um, those city planning or those um, AI solution um, need to be implemented? Good. And the implementation issues we will see in the foreseeable future, uh, as it stands. Uh, these are more research projects than their actually uh, applications. So we are uh, still at the very early stages. As you can see, uh, most of these things are still academic projects. While we are already working with cities to do stuff like this, but we are really talking about uh, pilot, a pilot stage. Uh, definitely what will be one of the challenges is to get uh, AI capabilities into software that's intuitive and can be used by um, uh, people playing it. We cannot, we cannot expect every city planner to be a computer programmer and AI expert. So we sort of have to provide these capabilities and software. This will definitely be um, one of the challenges we are facing. And then um, uh, the other challenge we'll be facing, we are in the process of digitalizing uh, many sectors of the economy. We have to make sure that we can uh, uh, include AI capabilities uh, in, in parallel. So essentially the software we're installing at the moment, it has to uh, be able to be connected to AI capabilities. But also, uh, you know, from our consulting work, we know that many companies work on this on digitalization and they are also obviously eyeing uh, AI capabilities and then make sure that these AI capabilities um, can, can be added. Mm. Mm. But in in future, do you think that like because I think there's include like um we need to have some um, AI expert to to work on it, and we need maybe the the company or the government's involvement 
and also the AI uh, capabilities. So in future, do you think like which part is the most most important if we, we need to make it happen? If we need to make it happen, definitely the development of AI and the responsibility of the development of AI. Obviously, there are huge issues with, for instance, data privacy. Um, um, uh, you know, is AI aligned with humanity's goal, etc.? That's one thing. So we have to give it a bit ethical. I think there will definitely be a, a, a lot, a good job market for everyone who's programming in AI. Um, I can definitely. That's one of the predictions I can make right here, right now. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, and the other thing is obviously, you know, getting these AI solutions to the market. And uh, again, I really think that uh, getting them in uh, a manner that you can use by everyone uh, is very important. Uh, but you can already see it from uh, GPT-4. Um, it's very intuitive and most people uh, can utilize it. It's going to be crucial that it's going to be implemented like this in planning software, in optimization of software that is used by corporates. Mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, um, so what's AI's role in communications or marketing plan make um, solution and policy like mm -hmm. ChatGPT? Good, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I haven't fed in um, uh, climate change to GPT, but I should have done that already. You're absolutely uh, right on that. Um, what I think uh, uh, these communication tools like ChatGPT, these language models, they should give a very balanced view of climate change. Yeah? They shouldn't be biased. Obviously, bias is also one of the big uh, issues uh, around climate change. Uh, and they should, you know, clearly and simply communicate the climate change issues to uh, people. In the end, obviously, we have to decarbonize the economy systematically, but also uh, we as consumers have a role to play with uh, adapting our consumption behavior. Uh, so uh, I think um, language models like ChatGTP uh, do play a, uh, do play a, a role in this as well. Mm. That's good. So uh, another question from Alex. So mm -hmm. um, the planning you previously or could be AI powered. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we see these capabilities coming online uh, as we speak. However, it's 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 not common practice right now. You know, we're still using standard uh, development tools, but as I already said, um, we have many universities working on it. Um, and we have many universities working, for instance, with uh, cities uh, on on the planning. But again, we are early stages here. Uh, I would hope that soon we see more of these endeavors coming online. Um, but we are still in the early stages. Okay. So uh, see if we have any other questions from the audience. I can see. I see Alex is typing. Yeah. <laughs> if we want to create and plan digital twins with the help of AI. Uh, in the end, that's what we're doing. Yeah. So. Um, uh, we don't build digital screens from scratch, but we, as I said, we are um, providing digital representations of uh, cities, and then we try to, you know, optimize and integrate the energy systems. We will assist with the with the planning, but again, also this is work in progress. Uh, this is not uh, completed yet, but uh, we're working uh, on it. Mm. Okay, then I think yeah, it's great. I think that's for this session and thank you so much for for your sharing and it's re i think it, it really it will be really great um someday we can see it can be really implement ai and and do the decarbonization yeah and uh, if you ask me um we always underestimate when it comes to this we'll see this uh, sooner than we actually would guess now yeah that's okay. true okay thank you so, so much thank you yeah.